Shane Wong trying to get that fourth wicket. And he's gone! It's the 3rd of May, 1995, and Australia are celebrating a series win over the West Indies in time-honoured fashion. Victory has been achieved by a team boasting two players whose prodigious talents lie at the heart of Australia's cricketing success. The defiant leadership and unshakable will to win of batsman Steve Waugh. And the genius of bowler Shane Waugh. First ball. For the past two decades, a country of just over 20 million people has dominated the empire of cricket. But how? Pure dominance by the whole Australian team. This is the story of the way Australia turned the sport of their privileged English colonizers into a game for all. The important difference between this country and England is that the idea of class distinction is something that we've, we've prided ourselves on, on not having. From the outback to the suburbs, Australians would play cricket their way. We have a crack and we have a red hot dip, we play it hard. That's how we're brought up, we play to win, but we're also the first to have great mates off the field. Cricket would provide a common bond, as a young nation united behind heroes like Don Bradman. I saw him play in the first match I ever went to at the SCG and Bradman suddenly became my hero because he got three centuries in the remaining three games. Australian cricket is intertwined with the country's emergence from Britain's shadow as a nation in its own right and as a mighty adversary in the ashes. We love our sport and we love the cricket team. You know, and for an Australian, since the age of about five, it's been belted into me that you can't let the Poms win anything. The same qualities that raised a nation from the heat and dust helped build a cricket team that would dominate the world. Determination, defiance, the desire to win, and an unquenchable fighting spirit. When we walked out on the park, we looked like 11 prize fighters entering the ring. And that's what I wanted us to be. He's done in between his legs. Lally. Come on, boy. There's Richie Benner looking as happy as any man has a right to be. Edmonds has scored his century before lunch. Australia, a country with a reputation for scorching heat. 36 degrees when we were out there just before play began, up to 38 now. It's a nice place to play cricket, if you like the game hot, hard and fast. The climate out here is very conducive to outdoor lifestyle in general and then you know, in a cricketing sense it's, it's fantastic. Such a rare occasion that rain would affect a game of cricket and then hence the outfields fast and dry and, uh, and wickets, you know, hard, really firm. In a harsh climate where grass pitches were often a luxury, generations of children turned rugged playing conditions to their advantage. In Australia, we all played on uh, concrete pitches or concrete with matting on, but that was uh, all you had you, if you were at uh, primary school and um, just playing in ordinary fashion, you certainly didn't play on turf pitches. It was good practice to have been on uh, concrete because there was plenty of bounce in that. The better cricketers like bounce in a pitch. It's good for batsmen, but it's also obviously good for fast bowlers, but it's also good for spinners. You know, a spinner who can get a bit of bounce, he's, he's happy. It's the perfect sort of upbringing to go on and play a high level of cricket. Australians have been playing cricket since the country was established as a British penal colony at the beginning of the 19th century. By challenging the forces of the Crown at cricket, Australia's new settlers were taking their first steps towards nationhood. 
In the 1830s and 40s in Sydney, uh, you have the uh, garrisons that were stationed here forming themselves into cricket teams and playing against the local cricket clubs. And one of the reasons why cricket has been so successful is that it has managed to serve both the purpose of paying imperial homage and exercising Australian nationalism, being an outlet for, uh, for our own desire to run our own affairs. In 1901, the Act of Federation transformed five British colonies into one new nation, Australia. At the same time, the foundations of the domestic game were being laid, with the beginning of the grade cricket competition. It offers talented players the chance to rise up through the ranks on merit alone. Unlike in the mother country. We've never had anything here as there was in England where professionals and amateurs played out of separate change rooms. And I imagine that was a, 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 um, a stultifying influence on, on, on cricket in England, whereas here, if you're good enough, you'll get there. And I think that has been a fundamental strength of the game here. The best player of them all would emerge from grade cricket in 1927. A batsman from the small town of Barrel, New South Wales, Don Bradman. And now let us see the Prince of Batsmen in action. Don Bradman, just come to man's estate and already known as the most phenomenal run-getting machine the world has ever seen. Born in 1908, Bradman grew up in a country scarred by the massacre of its troops at Gallipoli in the First World War and struggling to cope with the Great Depression. The 30s were the depression years, which were tough going for people, and you were looking for some role model, and he became that as a uh, as a as a cricketer, and he represented Australia, represented the country, really. As a child, Bradman honed his cricketing skills by using a stump to hit a golf ball against a water tank. With incessant practice. Bradman turned a natural gift into complete mastery of the art of batting. Bradman's a record winner. Don goes all out to put runs on the board. He puts 50 to his own neck. The thing that amazed me about him was the, his quickness of his eye, the, his perfect position of his feet, and the ability to pick up the line and the length of the ball quicker than anybody else. He wasn't afraid to cross the line, square cuts, pull shots, hook shots. He was just a freak, that's all he was, just a freak. Well, his approach was tremendous, great concentration, had all the strokes, got the runners very quickly. Whether he got 100, 200 or 300, he got them very quickly. Bradman has scored his century before lunch. Don Bradman, the possessor of more records than a gramophone company. Bradman's record-breaking scoring feats in the domestic game caused a sensation in Australia. But it was against England that his legend would be born. In the 1930 Ashes series, Bradman dominated England's bowlers, scoring 974 runs. That's his 200. Well done. The scoreboard reads remarkable at the end of the first day. 458 is the total, out of which Bradman has made 309 not out. It's a world's record. When he started to play his matches again in Australia, you got into a situation where people would flock to the grounds when they knew he was going to bat. And if he got out, they'd go. Don Bradman, as a batsman he can show lay on the wall. Bradman's heroics made him a highly marketable commodity. His image used to sell everything, from biscuits to sports equipment. But in person, he came across as the Australian everyman. Even though he was the most famous man in Australia, and easily the most, one of the most famous sportsmen in the world, in Australia he lived a very ordinary life. You know, he sold sporting goods, he, he sold shares, he married his childhood sweetheart, he 
raised two children in the only house that, that he ever bought. This is a country that exalts the ordinary man and it was a sign of Australia's veneration of that ordinary man that they allowed Bradman to lead an ordinary life. Australia's ordinary hero carried a nation's hopes of victory in the 1932 Ashes series. England's visiting cricketers had one objective, to stop the Don. England developed a bowling technique known as leg theory, designed to restrict Bradman's free-flowing style of play. Larwood bowls to a leg trap to which Bradman falls a victim when he has only scored eight. Australia were forced into a corner by body line bowling aimed directly at the batsman. They had two options, fend off the ball and risk offering an easy catch to the waiting fielders or take a blow. The umpire scrutinizes every delivery of Larwoods for a no ball. The English players are very distressed when Oldfield is struck on the head. Larwood again being the unlucky bowler. The controversial bodyline tactics would place the relationship between England and Australia under immense strain. Well, I think it's been characterised as the um, war of independence that uh, Australia never fought from England. Uh, it, uh, it, it seemed from here such an unfair way to, to deal with the, with the problem of Bradman. Bradman appears. He is not very comfortable against Larwood. I think there was a sense of mortification for Bradman to find that the English were prepared to play to the limit of the laws. It was really a little bit confronting. Some Australians, of course, never really forgave the English that sense of disillusionment. A major diplomatic incident was only averted when Australia withdrew accusations that England had used unsportsmanlike behaviour to win the series. The outbreak of war in 1939 reunited Britain and Australia in the fight against common enemies. Australia came of age in its battles against Japan, but the shared experience of enduring a long and painful conflict would bring Britain and Australia closer together. In the spirit of peace, cricket would help renew the ties of affection between the two countries when Don Bradman took an Australian team to England in 1948. Uh, we are very glad indeed. In fact, I cannot tell you how delighted we are to be back in England once again. We're very anxious to get on shore and get on with the business. There is a sense of pilgrimage about that Australian side going to England after the Second World War. They take cases of food to, um, to, to present to embattled Englishmen in, in reciprocation of the hospitality that they expect. And they go about with a sense of trying to entertain, to, to lift spirits. As Bradman's side embarked on an unprecedented run of victories, the press hailed them as the Invincibles. Every foot of spectator space is taken up at Headingley, the bogey ground of England test cricket, as Bradman leads his Invincibles onto the field. I all wanted to see him because he's been such a tremendous uh, player over there. He's made squillions of runs every time he's been there and um, they just wanted to see him one last time. Bradman might have had top billing, but players like Arthur Morris and Neil Harvey thrilled the crowd with their batting exploits. And Australia's youngest player, Harvey, came to the rescue. 
Not only was he playing in his first test over here at the age of 19, he also made a century. I can see no point in being a defensive cricketer. I always think that cricketers should be entertainers, and I tried to be one. I always went out with the idea, you've got the ball, I've got the bat, I'm going to beat you. Simple as that. When the Ashes came to an end at the Oval, Australia were on course to finish the series undefeated. And Bradman needed just four runs to finish his career with an almost inconceivable batting average of 100. Here's the applause for Bradman as he comes in. Well, it's a wonderful reception. The whole crowd is standing and the England team are joining in and led by Yardley, three cheers for the Don as he gets to the wicket. Bradman went out late in the day. There was some thought that he might have sent a night watchman out, but uh, he wouldn't do that. He went out himself and Holly's um, bowled him a good one first ball. He bowls, Bradman goes back across his wicket and pushes the ball gently in the direction of the Houses of Parliament and a beautiful wrong in the next ball. No run, still 117 for one. Two slips, a silly mid-off and a forward short leg close to him as Holly pitches the ball up slowly and he's bowled. Arthur Morris, batting at the other end of the pitch, couldn't believe his eyes. And he was bowled for a duck, but it's extraordinary. Dead quiet everywhere, you know that. And everybody was stunned, including myself. I think I heard somebody say, well, well bold, uh, well bold, Eric. What do you say under those circumstances? I hope, I wonder if you see a ball very clearly in your last test in England, the ground where you played out some of the biggest cricket of your life, and where the opposing team have just stood round you and given you three cheers and the crowd has clapped you all the way to the wicket. I wonder if you really see the ball at all. Bradman's career had come to a close in a moment of anti-climax that became known as the duck of destiny. Australia finished the series with a fourth victory and Bradman bowed out having scored, on average, 99.94 runs per innings. It was a rare hint of fallibility in a player with almost superhuman abilities. I once said to, to Keith Miller what a sorrow it was that Bradman had retired from first-class cricket in 1950 and that was the year I came into the game and therefore I never had the opportunity to bowl to him and Miller looked straight ahead, he didn't even turn his head. He said, son, we all have at least one lucky break in our lives. You can count that as being yours. Bradman's batting to Larwood. That gives him his century. He's always going to be above everyone else and, um, and we're proud that we've got him. We're proud that he literally averaged 100. Um, he was a, probably one of the greatest sports people ever. And uh, it's something for us to say, well, I played for Australia in the baggy green cap and I followed in the footsteps of Don Bradman. Bradman retired when relations between Britain and Australia were at their most cordial. It's almost summer In 1954, the young Queen Elizabeth II was invited to tour the country by Anglophile Prime Minister Robert Menzies. But in an era of prosperity and conformity, Australian cricket had become dull, slow, and just a bit too English. The wicket is expected to favour the batsman. But Bailey, with characteristic caution, is not... 
never worried about uh, being criticised for being over exuberant. I'd, I'd, I'd have been worried if uh, people were saying I was under exuberant. Richie Benner, an all-rounder with a natural instinct for leadership, would liven up the game with his ingenious spin bowling and spirited celebrations. I can remember a lot of the ex-players um, thought that was awful. You didn't go around slapping one another on the back, but uh, I wanted to be happy when we were doing well. Oh, magnificent catch by Simpson. And Brian Johnston used to chuckle and say, uh, that he supposed the next thing would be a bit of hugging and kissing, but uh, we never got to that stage. Now, the other thing I'd like to congratulate you on is the whole attitude of the game. You came here saying you were going to play bright cricket, you have done. Are you happy that it's gone right like that? We've given the public as much uh, good cricket as we possibly can. We've always tried, that's the big thing. Mm -hmm. Benno's brand of bright cricket provided a glimpse of a more confident Australia. But as long as Robert Menzies was in power, the country would struggle to shrug off the dead hand of empire. I did but see her passing by, and yet I love her till I die. There was a long period of conservative government in Australia from 1949 to 1972. Uh, the country had been effectively run, but not particularly imaginatively run. And there was a pent-up desire in Australian society for change. The election of Gough Whitlam in 1972 ushered in a new era of national pride and assertiveness in Australia. What Australia is trying to do is to establish an independent identity in the world. Our actions are in no way anti-British. They're simply pro-Australia. After decades of following Britain's lead, Australians began to discover their own identity, embracing homegrown heroes like comedian Paul Hogan. I've never had any trouble getting shareholders to talk. I've had trouble getting them to shut up, that's all. Hogan represented the typical Aussie larrikin, a lovable rogue with a fondness for beer and sheilas that much of Australia had once been too embarrassed to acknowledge. Now, it's so long been a colony out here and they've had this hang up about being descended from the convicts and all that sort of thing that uh, that's sort of a shame to people like me to a certain extent but suddenly they've grown out of that they realize it's a big place now and they stand on their own feet and uh, they don't need they don't need help off anybody you know it might be the other way around i think england in a couple of years time probably need help off us you know we'll help you out yours well i think you should all get together get into this make up a bundle and send it over to britain i've also dropped in here the old don bradman book on how to play cricket i need a few lessons if anyone was going to give England a lesson, it was Australia's new captain, Ian Chappell. A player who combined the brash appeal of Paul Hogan with the inspirational leadership of Gough Whitman. It's four runs. It's a nice shot. My whole, this whole upbringing was about aggressive batsmanship. And, and so that really moulded my style. Chappell would use the hook shot to stamp his authority on England's bowlers in the 1972 Ashes. And he goes for the hook. To me, the hook shot was never just about the number of runs you scored from it. So the bouncer hooked away again beautifully for yet another four. It, it was also about the psychological advantages that you can gain from uh, playing the hook shot. That's a fine shot. And I always felt that someone in the top order had to take on the fast bowlers and hook them. Young chapel. So that you established, okay, you, you might want to bowl some bounces at us, but you do it at a risk. Well, that's the hook shot, and he's middled that one all right. So still accepting the challenge is Ian Chapel. Chapel's Australia set out to prove England's tabloid doubt is wrong in the 72 Ashes series. We had a manager, Ray Steele, who was a very competitive guy, and he reads out these headlines. Aussies take it lying down. And he thumped the table and he said, pigs bloody ass they do. It was a rallying cry that inspired Ian's brother, Greg Chappell, 
Hayes. And here's Dolivera to Greg Chappell. It's a fine shot, and he needn't run for that. Off the back foot, sweetly timed, four runs. We were bullish, we were aggressive, we were um, confident in our own abilities, and we went out there and we played to, played to win. That's it, pushed away, no bother at all. Look at Marsh, look at Sheehan, absolutely delighted, joyous Australians up on their balcony. The Chapel gang that blazed a trail in the 70s boasted a bowling partnership famed for terrorising batsmen from both ends of the pitch. Dennis Lilly and Jeff Thompson. Oh, and he's out. I'm trying to scare him, trying to probably hurt him more than anything else so that he at least knows you're around. Well done, old fella. Well done, Tommy's can run as quick as this thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, really quick. You know, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to say you sound like a, a you know, like you're uh, bragging up, but I know it was. I know what I did. Thompson to Lloyd. He's going to hit badly there, that's him. Lily and Thompson had learned to use their pace to get the ball to bounce high off hard Australian wickets, a delivery known as a bouncer that struck fear into batsmen wearing little protection. There's another bouncer. That's quite a performance to get one so high on this pitch. It's a short ball and it's generally around somewhere in the middle of the pitch. But it's aimed to be up here, you know, around you, your throat sort of thing, so it's awkward. You can't play the shot and if somebody plays it, they're trying to defend themselves more than anything. Even after body line, there was nothing in the rules to prevent bowling at the batsman's body. It was up to him to get out of the way. You bowl a bouncer, make sure you hit somebody. You miss, I hit, and then it hurts. There's no doubt that uh, those two together were as formidable a pace attack as I'd ever bumped into. And Derek Underwood came out to bat and he, he said to me, well, you know, what do you, what do you reckon? And I said, mate, it's a straightforward question of fighting for your life. Thompson bowling to Greg. Oh, bowled him. You're off him. Thanks, Tom. Uh, they would have been nervous. Don't worry, I could see they were nervous. And the opposition, as I walked back to my mark, they were there, well, all the ones that were waiting to come in, lined up. I just used to look at them and say, you're next. <laughs> they were terrific to handle and, uh, you know, I mean, the, the sign they had here at the SCG uh, during 74-5 Ashes series, what was it? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. If Lily don't get you, Tomo must. It was, uh, that summed it up. The crowd who cheered on Australia saw themselves in players like Lily and Tomo. The fans were fellow larrikins, well acquainted with Mr. Booze. Mr. Booze, oh, Mr. Booze. Mr. Booze. Mr. Booze. Mr. Booze. Got enough, have you? Yeah. How many are you taking in? Oh, a dozen. A dozen? Is that all you need for the day? Oh, yeah. So it was just jam-packed, the atmosphere was electric, they were allowed to bring their own alcohol in. You got enough for the day then, have you? Oh yeah, we got enough. Nice hot day. See you later. Thank you. So they'd bring in eskies, uh, you know, absolute giant eskies full of booze and be on it all day, so, you know, they, but by, by lunchtime they were starting to hum. What the hell am I doing out here? I thought this was a cricket match. <laughs> I thought they were at buddy Madison Square Garden. <laughs> There's an enormous 
um, feeling between the public and, and that team. Uh, they were a good bunch. They were, one, they were a good bunch of blokes. Two, we could play cricket and, and we played a decent brand of cricket. And three, we had a damn good time together. You make me laugh. You make me cry. Mr. The exploits of the Chapel Gang brought fans back to cricket in their thousands. The money might have been piling into the coffers of the Australian Cricket Board, but the players weren't getting it. When I first played for Australia, it was $200 for a test match. $200. Um, mate, we used to drink that on the first night. We looked at each other and we said, now hang on. You know, the gate taking is a quarter of a million dollars. We're being, you know, 12 of us, we're being paid $200. That's $2,400. OK, so England have got to get some. Where the hell's the rest of it going? The Australian Cricket Board, under the leadership of Dom Bradman, clung to the belief that the honour of representing Australia was compensation enough. The administration at the time was, was mired in a, in a, a bygone era. And uh, the feeling was, well, if you blokes don't want to play, we'll find some others that do. And, um, you know, w we felt that we were not being treated well and we weren't being respected and we reacted accordingly. We, we let it be known that we weren't happy with the, with the situation. Word of the players' resentment reached one of the new breed of Australian businessmen, Kerry Packer, a media mogul who had long coveted the TV rights to cricket. Well, I like the game. Uh, I enjoy watching cricket. Uh, I don't think because I enjoy the game that necessarily I have to agree with all the traditions. He went to the Australian Cricket Board, he said, um, uh, we're all whores, what's your price? And they sent him on his way, thinking that they'd never hear from him again. Well, Packer thought that if they won't give me the rights to Australian Test Matches, I'll create my own. I'll create my own independent, uh, outlaw, televised cricket circuit, and I'll call it World Series Cricket. These are the men who put the cat among the pigeons. They believe the concept of World Series cricket will be good for crickets and good for them. Their revolution has already won fairer rewards for cricketers. That was one of their aims. They have another to bring you the best cricket played anywhere in the world. 55 Behind the scenes, Packer had persuaded many of the world's best players to abandon their national sides and join unofficial Australia, West Indies and rest of the world teams. Many in the press and public saw it as a betrayal. I was at Melbourne Airport and I was just walking along and some guy came up to me and he said, you're a traitor. Now, I mean, that word really gets up my nose at the best of times. And I grabbed hold of this bloke and I started abusing him and one of his mates came home and he said, oh, you know, go easy on him, mate. He, he's, he's had a heart attack. I said, if he calls me a traitor again, he'll have another bloody heart attack. Launched in December 1977, World Series cricket got off to a slow start. Australian spectators have been a bit dubious about the Packer series in the sense they thought it was a bit of an exhibition. They thought as their players perhaps weren't really trying. Even though there was a lot of money on the line, did it really matter? If the players were to convince the public that they were in it for more than just the money, they would need to show it on the pitch. I'm Lee Roberts here, the most experienced of the West Indian fast bowlers and a great fast bowler in his own right. Come in on the see if he can put the break on. Hit him. When Australian batsman David Hooks had his jaw broken by West Indian bowler Andy Roberts, the intensity of the competition was no longer in doubt. And he's in trouble. In a sense, David Hooks shed blood for World Series cricket, and by his blood, he authenticated the exercise. And he's retired hurt for the moment on 81. Basically, it was unbelievably tough cricket. We also had, in the initial stages, some very ordinary pitches. And so, you know, that's why the crash helmet was born, or the helmet was born. And he's got him on the helmet, I think. Could be the first strike, and Lily, <laughs> the man to do it. 
is the first time we've seen that helmet tested out in action, and here it is. Kerry Pack wanted it to be tough. He wanted it to be entertaining. Above all, he wanted it to rate on television. I think he quite liked the idea of revving the game up as well. We've been training all the winter, and there's not a team that's fitter, and that's the way it's got to be. Because you're up against the best, you know. This is super test, you know. And you've got to beat the best the world has seen. Lily's pounding down like a machine. Pascal's making divots in the green. Marsh is taking wickets. Fox is clearing tickets. And the chapel's eyes have got that killer clean. Come on, Aussie, come on, come on. Come on, Aussie, come on. World Series cricket finally won over the Australian public with radical innovations like night games and brightly coloured clothing. Players were now well-paid professionals, well protected under helmets. Packer had reinvented the game as a prime-time spectacle with its own theme tune. Here comes the stampede. Cricket needed a revolution. You know, we were stuck in the, the 40s and 50s, maybe even the 20s and 30s, and cricket needed to be dragged, you know, kicking and screaming into the 20th century, and um, that's what World Series cricket did. Packer had proved his point, and in 1979, the World Series came to an end when the Australian Cricket Board finally agreed to collaborate. The rush to fill Packers' TV schedules with officially sanctioned cricket would lead to a punishing timetable of test and one-day games that put new captain, Greg Chappell, under immense pressure. The captain in those days served almost as the coach, the manager, the media manager. He was doing everything. So players, even a player as great as Greg Chappell was beginning to buckle under the strain. In 1981, New Zealand needed a six from the last ball to tie a dramatic one-day match against Australia and force yet another game. Long discussion. Well, it looks to me as if they're going to bow underarm off the last ball. Rod Marsh is saying no, mate, but I'm sure he's going to bow an underarm delivery. Greg Chappell would deny New Zealand the chance to tie the game by instructing his youngest brother, Trevor, to bowl underarm. A desperate measure to avoid another match. The batsmen have been told, and this is possibly a little bit disappointing, they're going to bowl an underarm. They never believed it. And that's a disappointing finish. Disappointed Brian McKechnie, the crowd boo. And it's all over. In a bid to relieve the pressure on Chapel, Kim Hughes began to share the captaincy, but he too found the burden of leading a weakened side against opponents like the mighty West Indies too much to bear. The constant speculation, criticism and innuendo by former players and section of the media over the past four or five years have finally taken their toll. It is in the interest of the team It's in, in the interest of the team, Australian cricket. <laughs> Kim Hughes' tearful resignation in 1984 left Alan Border in charge. If Australia was going to return to winning ways, he needed help. The first step was the appointment of a veteran player as the country's first full-time coach, Bob Simpson. We just need to get back to the simple fundamentals of the game, you know, the work ethics, doing it right. And uh, that's what we worked on, running between wickets, bowling line and length. And uh, in the end, we became a, a very, very competent team. Simpson's training regime propelled Australia to an unexpected victory in the 1987 Cricket World Cup. At a time when the country had become the focus of the world's attention, thanks to Crocodile Dundee, a film part-funded by Kerry Packer and cricketers Greg Chappell, Rod Marsh 
I'm Dennis Lilly. But it was through sporting glory that Australia looked to enhance this new international prestige. With sports fanatic Bob Hawke running the country, the world's first specialist cricket academy was set up to nurture the next generation of talent. Bob Simpson would build on Australia's success in the World Cup by taking fielding to a new level. I was very anxious to get the fielding as good as we possibly could because A, it would make life tougher for the batsmen, but it gives a huge boost to the bowlers if you're picking up great catches or you're stopping balls going for four where other players might let it go. And we could put on pressure on the opposition. The academy would use a combination of sports science and psychology to improve young players, like Justin Lanner. I loved practicing, I loved the physical practice and the, uh, and the technical practice, but ultimately it was about learning about mental toughness, eliminating all distractions and seeing nothing but the ball released out of the bowler's hand. The academy's system of rigorous training and discipline helped produce a group of players who became the backbone of Australia's success in the 90s. Yet it was a bowler with little time for the academy's strict rules who provided Australia with the magic that would turn them into the best side in the world. All I wanted to do was play Australian rules football, but it uh, wasn't quite quick enough, wasn't quite good enough to play at the top level. I played reserves and under-19s, but never made it to, uh, to play a senior game. So cricket was something that interested me in the summer, and I only really played because my friends did. Born and raised in suburban Melbourne, the setting for TV series Neighbours, Warren was a product of the Australian dream of carefree affluence. Shane Warren was a classic, rather pampered suburban boy, adrift in Australian prosperity. Two things that he did have. He had a tremendous charm and affability, and he also happened to have the physical attribute of a superb wrist and superb fingers, and an ability to make the ball absolutely sing. Warren had honed his bowling skills in the domestic game with Victoria, but in England, he was still relatively unknown until an extraordinary Ashes baptism in 1993. For an Australian, since the age of about five, it's been belted into me that you can't let the Poms win anything. So <laughs> I'm about to play my first Ashes Test match and I, I remember looking down the wicket and Mike Gatting was on strike and I thought, I'm about to bowl Mike Gatting, he's a very good player of spin too. Shane Warne's variety, apart from the stock leg spinner, he bowls a wrongen or a googly, he has a top spinner and he also has a flipper. I felt I was quite happy against spin. But this man came up and uh, bowled this ball which um, you could tell had a lot of spin on it because you could you could see where it was going to swing in and swung in late so you knew it had a bit of spin on it. But then it turned and it turned an awfully long way uh, from where it pitched just outside leg stump. Ian Healy, the Australian wicketkeeper, was going down the leg side waiting to collect it, and then all of a sudden it just changed course dramatically and uh, spun so much it uh, it missed my wide frame uh, and just just clipped the top of the off bale. And it, 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 you know, you normally hear the death rattle, but you didn't because it just lifted the bale off. First ball. Bale is off. He's bowled him. Gatting can't believe it. Dickie Bird, I suppose, can believe it. First ball, lethal. Shane Warne's ability to make the ball turn so dramatically owed much to the way he gripped the ball. I think that the trick to this is having a loose grip. Uh, and the reason I say that is because if you have a loose grip, it means you're relaxed when you're bowling. It helps you relax. If you've got it tight, it means you're really tense. So as you're coming into bowl, you're really tense. So if you can have a looser grip, you're more relaxed when you're coming into approaching the crease to bowl. I think that gives you an ability to bowl what you want to bowl. Our veils and misty, 
You wouldn't believe it. He's done in between his legs. Mike Gatting knows what it's all about. That's what the bat's for, son. Ever since Lillian Thompson and the all-conquering West Indies sides of the 1980s, fast bowling had dominated cricket. Spin was feared to be a dying art until Shane Warne revived a bowling technique steeped in mystery. And all of a sudden, Shane Warne has struck. What a wicket this is for Australia. With quick bowlers, you know, you've got fear. Because if a ball at 150 kilometres an hour hits you, or 90 mile an hour hits you, it hurts. So the quick bowlers have fear. Uh, for us spinners, we have to try and deceive. We have to try and uh, create sometimes something that's not really there. You have to sometimes create the illusion that the wicket is turning. Even if it's only turning a little bit, you've got to create that it's actually turning more than that. And that's where there's a lot of, oh. Come on, boy. Now he's getting in a tangle. Wicket keepers like Ian Healy and Adam Gilchrist would help generate the sense of anticipation around Warren's bowling. Everyone always makes comment about heels first, and I guess to a certain extent myself, saying bowling Warney or bowling Shane, and try to create that wall of pressure around the, the, the batsman. Oh. Australia would seek to increase the pressure by sledging, a constant stream of banter aimed at unsettling the opposition. Yeah, look, you, you can sense opposition players who are feeling pressure and they, they look a bit agitated or, you know, there, there might be ways you can, you can sort of um, not put them off their game, but get them thinking about something they shouldn't think about. Oh, yes, stay there. Long enough to hear those sweet words. What did you say? It takes a strong-willed batsman to ignore a gang of gum-chewing Aussie fielders, questioning his ability, his place in the team, and his wife's honour. It's all about getting you to play the man and not the ball. That's what it's about. That's what Shane Warne is absolutely brilliant at. When you face Shane Warne, you're up against two, two different sides of him. You're up against the technically correct, fantastic, skilled leg spin bowler. Yeah. Well, he's done it. And you're also up against the man, the competitor, the guy who has a little sly comment as you walk past, maybe when you're not at the crease, trying to undermine you. He's trying to create a contest between you and him, not you and the ball, and that's what you've got to remain focused on. On oh, it's bowled him. Bowled him out of the rough. Gooch not even uh, playing a shot. Well, he was sort of attempting to kick the ball away, but that spun a long way. Shane Warne's spin was the secret weapon in a team that had become a tough, close-knit unit famed for their athletic fielding. But to prove they were the best team in the world, Australia would first need to defeat the West Indies. I remember when I first started playing, it was about, we talked about competing, not about beating those guys. So they were the, uh, the ultimate cricketing machine and, uh, and they intimidated a lot of teams, including Australia. He's put it down. Steve Waugh really feeling it. Steve Waugh grew up in Bankstown, the Sydney suburb that had produced Australia's belligerent Prime Minister, Paul Keating. Why won't you call an early election? Yeah. The, the answer is, mate, mate, because I want to do you slowly. I want, I want to do you slowly. A nation that had fought hard for respect on the world stage wasn't about to be bullied on the cricket pitch. This really is going to be a great confrontation. This uh, currently seems to have uh, fired himself up for this test match. Stephen Moore won't take a backward step, and uh, now we've got test cricket at its best. Ambrose was just too good. I couldn't lay bat on ball. He was just uh, past the outside edge, inside edge. I was getting a bit frustrated by that, and Kirtley, as he always did, would sort of bowl the ball, and then he'd, he'd run down. He'd be a couple of what, yards away from me, just stare at you. And he's a pretty intimidating sort of sight. Here's Ambrose. <laughs> a 
and after one particular bounce he was down there again and I just said why don't you so and so go back and back to your mark and he didn't like that too much and I gave him a bit more advice after that and that's when things got out of control and I was left standing there thinking I've smashed open hornets next year um, what am I going to do when I mean, it's on TV there's millions of people watching um, you can't look like a coward and back away now you've got to stand there and pretend you're tough so that's really what I did I was hoping and praying that Richie Richardson was going to come in and pull him away because he was far too big for me and uh, they're exchanging a few words out there uh, batsman and bowler it uh, just shows you how serious uh, these two are didn't matter if there were hand grenades in the pitch or a bowler running in with a rifle. Um, Steve War always wanted to be there. He's the most stubborn cricket I've ever played against. Certainly fired the crowd up here, Tony, and uh, I wonder if this will be a little bit quicker. And as you predicted, AD, it's got him fired up. Well, certainly brought the test match to life. I don't know whether the viewers can hear the crowd, but uh, they're certainly loving this confrontation. And uh, I must admit, I'm enjoying this from 150 yards as well. In the deciding test in Jamaica, Steve Waugh would haul Australia into a winning position by scoring 200 runs over nine gruelling hours. Can you just give me one more try at that? Yes! That's a give. It's a good side side. No need to run for that. And they'll come for the fourth pitch of the winner of his 200. You got nothing to say! One of the greatest moments in his career. But Australians running out from everywhere here, standing ovation here at Kingston. On the final day of the test, it fell to Shane Warne to bowl Australia to their first series victory against the West Indies for 22 years. Come here. And he's gone! And that's it! Well, I think in 95 when we beat the West Indies, that was the changing of the guard. Where they were the renowned as the best side in the world. And they beat everyone. We were the first time, first side to beat them in the West Indies for a long, long time. <laughs> wow. Well, are you having a good time? Hey, why not, mate? Why not? I woke up the next morning uh, a little bit hungover. I had the, still the whites on and the spikes, and uh, I had the baggy green cap still in the head, so. <laughs> I had a nice indentation in my head for about a day. By 2000, Sydney was hosting the Olympics and Australia were the dominant force in world cricket, winning a record 16 consecutive test matches. Their triumphs on the pitch reflected a country brimming with national pride and confidence. A mood Steve Waugh would evoke in his captaincy by connecting cricket to defining moments in Australian history. Australia has a very simple and, and, and relatively unambiguous nationalism. And as a result, he was able to draw on, on growing impulses, not just in the Australian team, but I think in the Australian nation in the period of his captaincy. We respected the traditions of the game, but we wanted to create our own little traditions as well. Um, things like going to Gallipoli on the way to England was something that really bonded the side. And the band played waltzing Matilda As the ship pulled away from the quay And amid all the tears, flag waving and cheers We sailed off for Gallipoli Talking about the battles, how there were 6,000 people killed uh, in hand-to-hand -hand combat on a, on, a, on a piece of ground the size of two tennis courts and we stood there and this was where it actually happened. That, that bonded us as a side. And he showered us with shell and in five minutes flat we were all blown to hell. Nearly blew us back home to Australia. Stars of cricket 
paying homage to the heroes of our past. Cricket played a crucial role in the Gallipoli conflict. Today, at the exact spot, it was reenacted. I always had the feeling that it was more than just about the game and, and, and cricket for Stephen. It was, there was a history of it, the tradition, um, you know, the honour of upholding that you know, standard. That standard is symbolised by the baggy green cap, awarded just once to Australia's cricketers and treasured throughout their career. The baggy green is something that the players have always worn. It, it unites us as a group. Um, it's something that's given out to very few people. Um, it's got great traditions and to me it was like a badge of honour. Every imperfection I had on my cap told me a story and it was part of my journey with me. We love the fact that our two national um, animals are on the, the emblem, the emu and the kangaroo, and they're two animals that don't, they can't go backwards. They don't physically go backwards, so never take a backwards step. So that's a source of great inspiration. That's why it's become so iconic. It, it, it sort of embraces everything about cricket, which in turn, in Australia, we feel embraces what's great about Australia. That's a great thing, look at that. Whoa, there's the proudest man in the nation right now. On it goes. Today, a new generation of Australian players wear the baggy green cap. And at the beginning of 2009, they were still the number one team in the world. Just. Australia might have regained the ashes with a 5-0 whitewash of England in 2007. Oh, well, that's close. That's but it was the last bow for many members of a once great team. Girl, I'm sorry. I just want you to come back. I'll admit just like I really can't back. Um, I think we always had a good balance of experience and youth. Maybe at the moment, just lost a few too many players at once. You know, Langer, Martin, Gilchrist, Warren, McGrath. I'll admit I was wrong about Justin Langer. That invincibility, that aura, seemed to have maybe disappeared a little bit. Um, only time will tell. Australia may no longer be the powerhouse that dominated cricket for almost two decades. But a nation that has come to define itself through sporting achievement will never lack the drive and desire to be the best. We like winning and we expect to win and we should win because we've got all sorts of natural advantages in this country. You know, we're a prosperous first world nation with a long tradition of sporting achievement. Sport is a central part of our culture. From Don Bradman's record-breaking feats to Richie Benno's breath of fresh air, from the Chapel Gang's rebellious swagger to the sorcery of Shane Warne and the courage of Steve Waugh, Australia has a habit of producing heroes to suit the times. Somewhere in the suburbs or the outback, there will always be someone ready to pull on the baggy green cap and go out to conquer the empire of cricket. Don't forget you can watch any of the episodes from the Empire of Cricket series on the BBC iPlayer. Highlights next on BBC Two from today's 2020 World Cup. Bali. 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 Bali.